He knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the goal and stairs I climb. Every bird is getting lighter. Every cloud is silver lined. There's a sun is always shining. There's no tear will dim the eye at the ending of the rainbow where the mountain touched the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my I don't know about tomorrow, it may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that be my portion may be through the flame or flood, but its presence goes before me, and I'm covered with his blood. Many things about tomorrow. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. they've just declared a state of emergency in, in, Lord, Lord, in Florida. Is that right? Well, tonight you're going to learn that there's no need for a state of emergency and there's no need for anyone here to fear. What I want to do today, I want to sweep the curtain aside and I want to show you the true role of microbes in disease. That's what I want to do in the first lecture tonight in the second lecture, I'm going to show you what your immune system is. And I'm going to show you how you can boost your immune system. My sister is a senior science teacher. And when she teaches her students uh, about the immune system, when she's finished, she see there's, you see, 
The body has been designed to heal itself. Everything we need for healing is actually in here, in our human body. And as we saw this morning in our poultice lecture, there are certainly things you can give the body that will enhance the healing process. And there are certainly things you can do inside as well that can heal or boost the healing process of the body. I was inspired listening to that beautiful song to share a verse with you, three verses actually. It's found in Isaiah 42, starting with verse 5. It says, Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that brought forth the earth and that which comes out of it, he that giveth breath to the people upon it, he that give a spirit to them that dwell, dwell therein. Verse 6, he says, I, the Lord, hath called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful verse? I, the Lord, hath called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand, no matter where you go, no matter what you go through. I, the Lord, hath called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee. To give thee for a covenant of the people and for a light unto the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes. Do you know there are many people in fear at the moment through ignorance. Their, their eyes, are, eyes are blind to the truth about the human body and how it heals. To open the blind eyes. To bring the prisoners out of the prison and they that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And doesn't that sound very much like the first reading that Jesus gave? He was 30. He just started his ministry. He went into the tabernacle on the Sabbath and they asked him to read a portion of scripture. And this is found in Luke 4, verse 18. And this is what he read from Isaiah. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and liberty to those that are bruised. Recovery of sight to the blind. There's that blindness again. And in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the Bible says, If our gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost. And then the next verse says, For the God of this world hath blinded the minds of men, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine upon them. Here's this blindness again. And notice in this one it said to, to blind the mind because the eyes are an extension of our brain. Proverbs 14, verse 6 says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. What my desire is, is to give you an understanding. And when you have an understanding of the roles of microbes on the planet, you then know where they should be, where they shouldn't be, and what their true role is. And you will find they are an integral part of life on planet Earth. So let's have a look at these microscopic little beings. They're called microorganisms. And microorganisms are everywhere. They are in the air that we breathe. They are on every surface area. They, they are everywhere. And there are 10 times more microorganisms in the body than cells. And there are approximately 100 trillion cells in the body. And 10 times that, microorganisms. And there are 10 times more microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract than anywhere else in the body. And when the body is working well, they are contributing to the proper running of the human body. But whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms have the ability to change roles. We have the ability to change roles. Isn't that true? Sometimes I'm a gardener and I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm gardening. Sometimes I'm sleeping and I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm sleeping. I'm not dressed now 
that I was, the way I was dressed when I left Sydney because it was very, very hot. <laughs> I'm actually not quite dressed now the way I was dressed in Wisconsin two weeks ago when there was three foot of snow on the ground. Now we adapt and adjust and change according to the environment, yes? So do the microbes. And whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms that are everywhere, that are in our body, they become the cleanup team. Or one microbiologist said to me, as microbiologists, we call them the garbage collectors. What are these garbage collectors? Their name is bacteria. That's what bacteria is, and that's what it does. It's an opportunist organism. To explain this fully, I want to give you the story of Florence Nightingale, a very famous nurse in the mid-1800s. And in the mid-1800s, uh, a war correspondence went to report on the war in Crimea. So what was happening is the British and the French were fighting the Russians in Crimea. The wounded were put in boats. This is the Black Sea. They were put in boats and they sailed down to a port called Scutari, and this is where the wounded were being taken. And they had converted ex-army Turkish barracks into a hospital there. So this war correspondent named Russell, he went to that hospital, and he was shocked. In that hospital, the death rate was 50%. You actually had a better chance on the battlefront than you had in that hospital. These poor young men, if they survived the trip, especially if there was a storm brewing. He wrote an article in the newspaper, made headlines. Did we raise our young men to rot in this filthy, putrid hospital? Well, the British people were up in arms. They were their sons. They were their nieces, their nephews, their grandsons. So very quickly, the British government sent Florence Nightingale and 35 nurses to Scutari to see what she could do. When she arrived, she was shocked, appalled at the conditions. There was raw sewage in the corridors. So they had to stop the bathrooms, and then the men, 30 men to a chamber pot. Can you imagine the smell? The doctors were not washing their hands between operations. She was so horrified at the sight, she quickly telegrammed her father, who was a very wealthy Englishman. She said, I need a shipload of clean linen, clean bandages, clean mattresses, and a cook. You know what they were eating? Big pots of water with bits of rotten meat in it. I'm surprised the death rate wasn't 80%. Isn't it incredible what the human body endures? She also contacted the British government. She said, you need to set up a sanitary commission. There's a crisis here. Now, that was a state of emergency. <laughs> she said, you need to set up a sanitary commission to assess what's going on here and make changes. So the sanitary commission came. Meanwhile, Florence and her nurses started scrubbing and cleaning. And this is what the sanitary commission found. They found that the hospital was built in a swamp. They found a dead horse in the swamp. They found a dead dog in the swamp. And the men were drinking the water out of that swamp. And that was the water that was being used in the hospital to wash the wounds. Oh. So very quickly, they contracted men to fix up the plumbing, to get rid of the dead horse and the dead dog, to start draining the water away, to start implementing better conditions in this hospital. Within six months of these changes, Florence on the inside, the workmen on the outside, under the direction of the Sanitary Commission, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. 14 months later, Florence Nightingale sailed back into London. She looked at the shore and she saw a big welcoming party. She saw Queen Victoria and Prince Albert hailing her as a heroine. She quickly changed her name to, to Mary Smith, went down the back gangplank and went home. 
And they said, why did you do that? She said, I am not a heroine. She said, all I did was increase sanitation, hygiene, and nutrition. She didn't believe that, that this, you know, what she had done warranted anything like this. But the British people were so grateful. They were their sons. They were their, <laughs> their grandsons, their nieces and nephews. The li sorry, no nieces there. Their lives were being saved. I want to give you a graph now. We, need, we should never forget Florence Nightingale. Before I give you the graph, I want, to sh I want to keep you down this line and then we're going to have a look at the graph. Because Florence Nightingale and her implementation of hygiene, that's personal hygiene, keep the body clean, wash it every day, wash the clothes. Sanitation, keep the house clean, empty the garbage, wash the bathroom, keep the house clean, and, and nutrition. And we looked at yesterday, you cannot heal without nourishment. This is what caused a massive reduction in the infectious diseases. Also in 1854, all the sewage from London went into the Thames and the people living in London drank that water. No wonder the Black Plague happened. They're just opportunist organisms. The more rubbish, the more waste, the more bacteria. As the environment changes, so do the microbes. They now become the exterminators. What are the exterminators? The exterminators... Sorry, should be an A there. Exterminators... That's the yeast and fungus. That's what it is. That's what it does. That's its role on the planet. And as the environment changes, so do the microbes. They now change roles and become the undertakers. And what do undertakers do? They take away dead things. Yeah? And their, ro their name is mold. And it is not long past the mold stage that the matter is now brought back to dust. And at the funeral, what does the preacher say? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What does he say that for? He's referring to what's about to happen in the coffin. The matter is about to be brought back to dust. What I have drawn for you here is the cycle of life. It is the carbon cycle. And the basic law of science states nothing's created and nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. So this is the carbon cycle. When the preacher says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, he's referring to Genesis 3.19, where the Bible says, we come from dust, we go back to dust, we're dust. And there's a lovely verse in 100 and some 103, it says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. We're dust. It's the cycle of life. Florence Nightingale knew this. And when she read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. And anyone who believes it is equally unstable, germs don't cause disease, they're the result. Can you see that? All Florence Nightingale did was clean up the hospital. There was nowhere for them to live. Can you see that? Well, let me show you the graph. And I believe that this graph is one of the reasons why my voice has been silenced in Australia. Here are all the childhood diseases. Mumps, measles, rubella, tetanus, whooping cough, polio. All three quarters, sometimes... We'll go percentages, 80, 90% wiped out. Polio, 100% wiped out. Then the vaccines were introduced. Now, we are not taught that, are we? Where did I get these figures? World Health Organization, uh, medical journals, the Bureau of Statistics. And there's a book called Stop Autism Now by Dr. Bruce Fife. And you will find the statistics in his book. There are many books that are blowing the whistles on these things. We've got another graph today. Attention deficit syndrome, hyperactivity, Asperger's. 
autism, epilepsy, cot death. That is what's killing our children today. It's not infectious diseases. So where are these neurological diseases? They're coming from the neurotoxins in the vaccines. If every parent said to the doctor, I will vaccinate my child if you sign this piece of paper saying that my child will not be damaged by the vaccine, no parent would vaccinate. Mm -hmm. Have a look at what's in the vaccines. There's formaldehyde. What's formaldehyde? It's a neurotoxin. There's aluminium. What's aluminium? It's a neurotoxin. That's why the children are coming down with neurological diseases. In the, in, uh, it was probably 70 years ago, one in 10,000 children were autistic. Today, one in 45. Ooh. And yet this has been hidden from us. You will not read this in the newspapers. My husband and I have come to the conclusion that we think the pharmaceutical company must own the newspapers. When you have a look at what's coming through, have you heard of the challenge by Robert Kennedy Jr.? $100,000 he will give to anyone who can show him one study that shows that vaccines don't harm children. It's two and a half years now. No study has come forward. In fact, when my husband started his political party campaigning against the government forcing vaccines on children, on adults. He met many professors, scientists, doctors, and he discovered, he was shocked when he found it, there are no studies to show that these vaccines are safe for children. And he found that every anti-vaccination person he met used to be pro-vaccination. He used to be pro-vaccination until his son got asthma after he'd been vaccinated. He recovered, and then the next vaccine, he got even worse. So he stopped vaccinating his son, and he did not vaccinate his daughter. I was pro-vax, because you're taught, if you want the best for your child, if you want your child to be safe, vaccinate. My child reacted. He screamed all night, and the wound was this big on a tiny little two-and-a-half-month-old baby. Whew. I didn't know. Not much was known then. This was in 1978, so my next child I didn't vaccinate till later. And then my fifth child, the naturopath, said, don't vaccinate this child. He is not well. That's my son that had asthma. He said, if, if you vaccinate this child, you'll probably lose him. So I did not vaccinate then. There's a lot of information out now. If the body's been designed to heal itself, we don't need to vaccinate it. Because God has already put in the body everything it needs. But what about polio? Let me give you the truth on polio. Let me give you the truth on polio. It was the mid-1800s. They started to use arsenic and lead in paint and DDT and then polio appeared. Someone finally put two and two together so they stopped the arsenic and lead in paint, they stopped the DDT and guess what happened to polio? Mm-hmm. There was an Australian nurse in the early 1920s named Sister Kinney. And Sister Kinney was called to a case of a child with polio. It was out in the country. The doctor was busy. The child was cramping. So she put hot packs on the child's legs and massaged the child all night. And by morning, the child relaxed and the child had recovered. And then she said to the mother, any more cramps, just do this. Every case of polio she was, that she heard of, she went and did the same thing. So she started a clinic and she taught other nurses do the hot packs and massage. 
And then children came into her in calipers because in a hospital they put them in the calipers. Did the same thing. Hot packs, massage. Those children walked out of her clinic. Now, not in an hour. Sometimes it took a couple of weeks. She had a pile of calipers this big in her clinic. A couple of her friends who were doctors wanted her to present this to a medical conference. They threw it out and said it was unscientific. They closed her clinic. They banned her. What are calipers? Calipers are like wooden things that they put the limbs in. That's when the children went deformed, when they were put in calipers. Isn't that incredible? Minneapolis had an outbreak. They called for Sister Kenny. She went over and she started clinics. Every single case of polio she treated with the hot packs and the massage, no deformities. Isn't that incredible? In fact, they made a movie of her. I think the actress from the 40s, Rosalind Russell, um, played in the movie or something. So you can, her, her name's Sister Kenny. I think Netflix and things, you can even find anything today, can't you? Sister Kenny, the Australian bush nurse who had incredible success in treating polio. There was a contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur named Antoine Bouchon. This man was six times professor. Pasteur was a chemist, but no one liked Antoine Bouchon's theory. So they're both Frenchmen, but they loved Pasteur's theory. Because you know what Pasteur said? Oh, you poor thing, a germ has jumped on you and made this sick. you sick. Take this poison, kill the germ. But you know what Antoine Bouchon said? He said, disease is born in us and of us. It's so much more convenient to blame the gene or the germ because then you take away all responsibility for what's happening in the human body. Now, these are just opportunist organisms. You'll just find them wherever there's damage or weight. That's what they do. That's what they do on the planet. Let me give you an illustration. Mother hen is sitting on 10 eggs. I come along and pick up one egg and shake it violently and put it back under mother hen. I come back two weeks later, I hear chirp, chirp, chirp. Little chickens are coming out of their eggs. What happened to the, what happened to the egg I shook violently? Well, a bad smell started to come out of it. So mother hen, she boots that out of the nest. She doesn't want those bad fumes to make her chicken sick. What did I do when I shook the egg? I caused massive cell damage. And so the microorganisms in the egg, this is a sealed unit, that would have contributed to the building up of the chicken had to take their suit of clothes off, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on and become the clean-up team. As the environment changed, the exterminators. As the environment changed, the undertakers. Until eventually, that rotten egg was brought back to dust. These are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. This is God's plan. In fact, if it wasn't for these microbes, there'd be so much rubbish on the planet, we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. They bring matter back to dust. That's their role. Antoine Bouchamp knew this. One day he got a dead cat. He put it in an airtight container. He came back four months later and opened the container. Now, if that cat died in the bush, I'm an Aussie. I have to give an Aussie uh, illustration. If the cat died in the bush, you call it the forest. Is that right? That sort of thing. The dung beetles come up. The worms come up. The um, kookaburra and the crow have a nibble. The, the dingo has a nibble. What are they all doing? They're all speeding up the process of bringing matter back to dust. Oh, and the blowfly lays its maggots, is that right? It's all designed to bring matter back to dust. But what Antoine Bouchamp did, he wrapped the dead cat in a dead airtight container. No dung beetles, no wallabies, no blowflies, no dingoes, no crows or kookaburras. What brought cat back to dust? Because four months later he opened it and it was dust. Maybe a few bones. 
What brought matter back to dust? The microorganism an integral part of living running cat upon death of the organism, that's the ultimate cell damaged, took their suit of clothes and off and put their rubber gloves and aprons on and become the clean-up team, then the exterminators, then the, then the mold, the undertakers, till eventually cat was brought back to dust. It's the cycle of life. Let's look at an apple tree. What causes the flower to develop? microorganisms. What causes the apple to develop out of the flower? Microorganisms. But the apple's not ready to eat. It must ripen. What causes it to ripen? The same microorganisms. They change roles according to the environment. No one eats the apple. So what happens to the apple? It rots. It rots under the action of the same microorganisms. Isn't that why we have compost bins? It's to bring matter back to dust, is that right? And when the matter is brought back to dust, we know when it's ready to put back in our garden because that's when the pawpaw trees, do you call them pawpaws, papayas, come out. This is when the pumpkin, you call them squash, is that right? We don't call it squash, we call it all pumpkin. And when they're starting to grow out of your compost bin, what do you know? is ready for the garden. Antoine Bouchon, he got the dust from the dead cat and he put it under the microscope. It was alive with microorganisms. They'd finished bringing matter back to dust. Now they're in the dust waiting for the next job. He even went to the pyramids, found dust, put under the microscope. Oh, I wonder if they were Tutankhamun's microorganisms. Nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. I have compost bins. And when the matter is brought back to dust, I shovel my compost into my garden. What am I putting in my garden? Microorganisms. Let's have a look. Here is my plant. Here are the roots. When I put compost into the soil, I'm putting microorganisms into the soil. The soil is alive. You can't see them. It's like I can't see them in the air. I can't see them on my skin. But they're everywhere. Now they play another role. Do you remember I said they're back in the dust? Well, they've brought the matter back to dust. Now they're waiting for their next job. Their role in the soil is this, the breakdown of the minerals in the soil and the absorption of the minerals into the roots of the plant. Aren't you glad we don't have to eat dirt to get our minerals? God made an amazing process that the microbes in the soil break down the minerals in the dirt, make them available for the roots of the plant, and then we eat the delicious plant. Is that right? Did you eat some lettuce today or kale or celery? Those microbes also protect the plant. They protect the plant against harmful pathogens. Those microbes also help to nourish the plant. And that plant knows that it needs those microbes. So 50% of the fuel that it makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the microbes. What a beautiful process. Do you know the hand of God is on all his creation, isn't it? And did you know that the law of service is on every plant? That plant takes from the sun, it takes from the soil for one purpose, to produce food for you and me. <laughs> it's the law of service. And the law of service is the law of life. The law of life is we take with one purpose, and that is to give. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to take it somewhere you may never have taken it before. Lining our gastrointestinal tract are villi, and they look just like the roots of the plant. 
And when we are in our mother's womb, our gut is sterile. But when we're born, we breathe in and get some microbes. We take the mother's colostrum, which is rich in microbes. And as those microbes come into our gastrointestinal tract, they form a thick turf wall over the lining of the gut. On Wednesday night, today's Monday, is that right? Yeah. Wednesday night, I'm going to take you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. We're going to start at the mouth and we're going to go all through down to the other end. And we're going to look at this again. Those microbes in the gut play the same role as the microbes in the plant. Those microorganisms in our gut, let me give you a name of a couple of them, Lactobacillus aphidophilus and Bifidus bacterium. You've heard of them? I am speaking English. <laughs> They're called our healthy uh, bacteria, that's right. Yep. Those microbes are responsible for the final breakdown of our food. They are actually responsible for the release of our B vitamins from our food. Those microbes are responsible for the absorption of our food out of the gut and into the blood. Those microbes are responsible for protecting our blood against any harmful pathogens. And those microbes are responsible for nourishing the little cells that line the gut. Last night we had a look at how they're remade every three to five days. They're remade here, they travel up, and away they go. Hippocrates, called the father of medicine, 400 years BC, he said, all disease begins in the gut. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to look a little different at the microbes? Where do viruses sit? Viruses basically sit about here. These microbes, God made, they're there for a purpose. And if they're out of control, we need to know why. Let me give you a story of two brothers. We've got Healthy Harry and Sick Steve. Healthy Harry's a landscaper. He's a surfer. He doesn't drink or smoke. He's a vegan. He exercises every day. And his brother is called Sick Steve. Sick Steve's always sick. Because Sick Steve never exercises. Both boys are in their mid-30s. He smokes cigarettes. He drinks alcohol every night. And he thinks Healthy Harry has taken all the fun out of life. We're going to have a look at fun in a minute. Cousin Colin visits and Cousin Colin has a bad cough. You could call it a cough or a cold or a flu or a virus. There's all sorts of names given to it. He comes in and Sick Steve comes out and he goes, Hi, mate. That's what we say in Australia. How you going, mate? Shakes his hand. Hi. <gasps> Chew. Oh, sorry, mate. Do you like it when people sneeze all over you then say sorry? <laughs> oh. So, sorry, mate, I got a bad, bad cold. Have you ever seen a, um, a little movie clip of what happens when someone sneezes? So, on, or, you see, when someone's got a cold, do you remember what I called it? It's a house clean. And what cleans the house? Well, here they are. Here they are. They're cleaning the house. And so these little droplets have bits of yeast and fungus, probably viruses, bacteria, and they jump into Sick Steve. And when they get into Sick Steve's body, they go, yippee, feast. What's their feast? It's damage, it's waste. And because he's a smoker, Sick Steve has a lot of damage in his throat, in the back of his tongue, all through his lungs. And basically, as there's so much good food there, these microbes multiply. Now let's back back a little bit. Healthy Harry comes in the room. Hi, mate. How are you going? Great. Shake hands. <gasps> Chew. Oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> All over Healthy Harry. They jump into Healthy Harry 
There's nothing to eat. What's their food? Waste, damage. So by the end of the day, sick Steve's got a terrible sore throat. He's starting to cough. And he says, that rotten cousin of mine, he's given me his wog. Don't we say that? He's given me his bug. Well, he gave it to healthy Harry, but nothing happened. Have you noticed when someone's get a cold, some get it and some don't? Let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Let's pretend that healthy Harry's just been to Hawaii on a surfing holiday. The plane fumes, breathing them. He couldn't eat as well as he usually ate and he, you know, he didn't want to drink a lot of water because he was on a window seat and he didn't want to have to jump over, you know, etc., etc., etc. So when Colin, when Cousin Colin visits and coughs all over him, there's actually a little bit of damage there. By the end of the day, healthy Harry's got a sore throat. Healthy Harry calls in the SWAT team. He starts drinking a lot of water. What do you do to clean the house? What do you do to wash the car? What do you do to wash the clothes, wash the dishes? Water! <laughs> water! Lots of water. So he's drinking a lot of water. He decides to go to the gym. He does a workout. Then he does a steam sauna and he dives into the cold pool and back into the sauna. As you'll see in my next lecture when we look about the immune system, best booster. And then he goes home and tomorrow morning we're going to have a look at some more natural treatments and I'm going to show you the flu bomb, but very quickly now, it's ginger, garlic, cayenne pepper, eucalyptus oil, lemon and honey and a little bit of water. Yeah, and you drink it. That's his flu bomb. So he drinks, drinks his flu bomb, drinks his flu bomb and then goes to bed early because the healing powers of the body are the most potent in the early hours of the night. So he goes to bed early and he sweats a lot that night. You see all these heating herbs help to bring out a little bit of a fever. Do you know fever's your friend? One lady rang up and she said, I've got a cold but I'm just so glad I haven't got a fever. I said, no, fever is fantastic. And when we do water therapies tomorrow, I'll show you, it's your friend. Things to remember with a fever. Fever's your friend. And when all the rubbish is burnt up, the fire will go out. And what puts fires out? Water. <laughs> That's what you've got to remember. Healthy Harry wakes up in the morning. Oh, he's actually feeling quite good. Oh, his clothes are a bit damp because he had quite a, a sweat last night. Has a big drink of water. Praise and thanks God for the healing powers of the body. You know, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. If you get a sore throat or a cold, what does God want you to do? Thank you. I'm having a house clean. And if you treat that house clean right, it'll usually be over in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then he puts his joggers on and he goes for a high intensity, running up hills, walking down hills, running up hills, walking down hills, comes back, more water, has a hot and cold shower, has his breakfast, has some fruits, and then has his antibiotic sandwich, spelt sourdough bread. We bought some very nice spelt bread in just your Whole Foods. We had it for breakfast today, very nice. Spelt. Spelt is wheat that hasn't been hybridized. <laughs> so he had his toast, put about a teaspoon of olive oil on that, crushed a whole clove of garlic over the whole slice, put some cayenne pepper on top of that, then avocado and tomato, calms it down. <laughs> and he had his two antibiotic sandwiches and he went to work. Wow. Did he speed up that house clean? What did I say? He called in the SWAT team. Yeah. Now, no one came near him at work that day. <laughs> I would like to suggest even his breath was probably disinfected with that garlic. <laughs> As one health, 
health professional said, no self-respecting germ's going to live in that potent mix. He said, it's all right, guys. I don't care if you don't come near me, but if I wasn't doing this, I wouldn't be here. They said, we don't mind. Keep it up. Now let's go back and look at sick Steve. Sick Steve wakes up. He felt a bit bad going to bed that night, so he threw down a couple of Jack Daniels. What do you think that alcohol is going to do to the microbes? The microbes. You know what they say? Thanks. Bring it on. Shut the window. I didn't want a draft, you know. Whereas over in the other side of the house, there's healthy Harry with his window wide open. Fresh air, oxygen. He feels terrible. So he wakes up and has a cigarette, a cup of coffee. Oh, the hot feels nice in his throat, but oh, I tell you, it's feeding the microbes even more. Makes an appointment to see his favourite doctor. He loves this doctor. This doctor never asks him uncomfortable questions. Never asks him if he's still smoking. Not every doctor is like that. There are some very good doctors. There are some very good plumbers too and there are some very good painters too, aren't there? And they're not so good painters and not so good plumbers. You've got to search it out. So he went in and he said, what are you doing here, Steve? Oh, my rotten cousin. He gave me his bug. It's Pasteur's theory, isn't it? That the germs are causing the disease. But they're everywhere. It's the condition of the body. He says, let me have a here. And he put the... Uh, stethoscope on his chest and whoa, were they having a party down there? He said, take this. What did he give him? He gave him an antibiotic. And sick Steve said, thanks doc, you're the best doctor in town. Why does he like him? He doesn't ask any uncomfortable questions. He starts taking the antibiotic. Within about 48 hours, he's clearing a little bit. Let's have a look at sick Steve 10 years later. Going through this every year, several times a year. He starts coughing up blood. He goes to the doctor. He's got lung cancer. Sick Steve says, why did God do this to me? Did God do this to him? I ask you, eh? who did it to him? He did, and in ignorance. Is that right? He didn't know. It is common sense, though, isn't it? He comes home. Healthy Harry says, what's the matter, Steve? He says, I've just found out I've got lung cancer. He says, the doctor wants to do radiotherapy and chemotherapy, Sick Steve says, while you're considering this, let me shout you two weeks at Eden Valley Health Retreat in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there the next two weeks. They do a very good program. They're actually running our program now. So he comes to Eden Valley. He hears this lecture and the light bulbs go off to open the blind eyes, yeah? Yeah to bring the poor that are out of the prison, to them that sick in darkness into the light. Yeah. His eyes are opened. He starts to see it as it really is. The cigarettes go in the fire and he makes a decision. I'm not doing this anymore. It's a life and death situation. He has had a big wake-up call. He didn't like the sound of the chemo and all its side effect. He was going to lose his hair. He was going to get diarrhea. He was going to start vomiting. And the doctor said it is not a cure. Did you hear that? This is what they'll often say. It is not a cure, but it's treatable. One lady said, I'm having chemotherapy because um, the doctor said it'll give me palliative care. I've only got six months to live, but I'm put on chemotherapy for palliative care. What's palliative care? That's just making life more comfortable for you in your last days. Is this comfort? Vomiting, diarrhea, losing your hair, losing all the feeling in your fingers and hands. I say not. I say not. 
Dr. Graham Morgan, he's an oncologist in Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. He and two other oncologists did, oh, one was a radiotherapist, another oncologist, they did a survey. I think it was in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, on chemotherapy in Australia and America, and the overall success rate after five years is 2.5%. Now, some cancers have a higher success rate than others, but even that success rate, it's only getting into 15%, 20%. I saw another um, article that was written on cancer medications. It said, new cancer drug, 50% cure. That sounds good. And then you read between the lines, two people were tested and one died. Now notice what, notice what um, Healthy Harry said to sick Steve. He said, let me shout you two weeks at Eden Valley Health Retreat to consider your options. One of the claims against me is that I claim to heal cancer. I have never done that. No human being can do that. The body and the body alone has the ability to heal when given the right conditions. And when people come to us wanting help with cancer, this is what I say. I have seen three outcomes. I have seen people totally turn around and heal from cancer. Number two, I have seen three months go to six years. Now, that's good news, isn't it? And number, that's number two. Number three, and I have seen the last days made more comfortable. So whatever stage, it's always a plus. But first of all, before I show you what can be done to turn this around, I want to show you what an antibiotic is. 1929, Alexander Fleming was growing bacteria in his laboratory. And he came in one day and he looked at the, little, the bacteria in the flasks. They were all dead. And he knew Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Why did his bacteria die? Do you remember Rudyard Kipling? I have six trusty serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what, why, when, where, how, and who. Do you take your six trusty serving men everywhere you go? And if your specialist or your doctor or your naturopath gets impatient with your questions, rise politely excuse yourself, don't pay the bill and find one who will answer your questions because you are employing them. Is that right? You are paying them a service. Let's have a look at what the word means, antibiotic. It means against life. Mm-hmm. And if we're living organisms, we have to get away from this kill mentality. Because anything that has the ability to kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large. And what are we? We're the large. So Alexander Fleming's looking at the bacteria in his laboratory. He looked around. He began to investigate. He couldn't see anything that may have killed it. And then he noticed an open window near the flasks. And the sun was coming in. And on the sun's rays, there was a heavy dust. And the heavy dust was settling on his bacteria. So he began to search where this dust is coming from. And on the next story, there was an open window. And in the open window, there was a plate of fruit. And in, on the plate of fruit, there was a mouldy orange. Do you remember the story from school days? And that mouldy orange is giving off a dust. In that dust is its spore. But in that dust is a highly toxic gas designed to kill off anything that would compete with the mole's food source. It's as if the mole says, this is my orange and no one else is going to get it. I'm going to give off a toxic gas to kill anything that might try and get my orange. What might try and get that orange? Other oh, yeast, moles, funguses, bacteria. So it came and settled on Alexander Fleming's bacteria and killed it. Alexander Fleming called the mold penicillium. He called the mold waste penicillic acid. And that mold waste is the mold 
That mold waste is the antibiotics penicillin that we know today. Mold waste. How many people have an antibiotic and then get thrush? Because what are they putting into their body? They're putting a mold waste. Now it is true that antibiotics have saved the lives of millions. Granted. And they will continue to save lives. But the problem today is the overuse of the antibiotic and the inability of the physician to ask why is this bacteria active there in the first place? Mm -hmm. Praise God that it is not acknowledged that an antibiotic can't kill a virus or there'd be an overload happening at the moment. Is that right? I told the story this morning about my daughter, Emma, when she was only 16 months old and got an earache. I was a nurse, so I took her straight to the doctor. Six, six weeks and four courses of antibiotics later, the earache came back. What's the definition of insanity? To every time she went off the antibiotic, it came back. In case of sickness, the cause must be ascertained. We eventually discovered she was teething. Gave her drops to keep the eustachian tubes clear. I discovered later one of the main causes of ear infections in babies and in children is dairy products, wheat and refined sugar. So what's the wheat? That's your bread. That's your pasta. That's your, <laughs> that's your cereals. One man wrote me a letter. He said, Barbara, you are wrong on the wheat. Jesus called himself the bread of life. I wrote back and said, you are absolutely right. Jesus is the bread of life. But the bread he's referring to is not the bread on our supermarket shelves today. Mm -hmm. On Thursday night, I'm going to be looking at heart disease and diabetes. And on Friday night, I'm going to be looking at the acid alkaline balance and arthritis. And in those lectures, I'll be showing you in detail what have they done to our wheat. And if you look at the little book by Ellen White called Temperance, on the second chapter, on the second page, she predicts that the devil would tamper with the wheat. Mm. One lady said, well, what do we eat? At our retreat, we show you life without bread. <laughs> it's not that bread's totally out. You can get the, you, have you heard of ancient grains? Ancient grain breads, these are the kamuts and the spelt. They have not been hybridized. So sick Steve, instead of taking antibiotics, he should have come to the health retreat, but he didn't know. He didn't know. And by the way, after he'd taken his antibiotic and the chest cleared a little bit, then he got the most terrible case of thrush. Because what's he just put into his body? A mild waste. I'm not against antibiotics. They have saved lives and will. But the World Health Organization have declared that the greatest health risk in the world today is antibiotic resistance. You've heard of that? Why are people getting antibiotic resistance? The overuse of it for a sore finger, for a sore knee. Ah. And you saw this morning, all you probably need is a ginger poultice. In fact, it's almost as if they give them willy-nilly, but they are being told to back off on the antibiotics. We're, we're creating a crisis. Well, we'll get to the point where they're not working. 80% of the antibiotics that are made are given to animals. So people are also getting it when they are eating meat and dairy products. I was talking to a farmer in Ireland. He was, in, he was late 70. He was driving me around. I was giving meetings there last year. He said, I used to be a dairy farmer. So he's in his 70s, and this is when he was in his 30s. He said the udders were so big and so heavy that the cow's hoofs would split. So they've been genetically modified to have big udders so they produce lots more milk so the farmer gets more milk. 
He said, I can't believe the amount of antibiotics we used to give those cows. And they would last four years. This is a milking cow. Now, when would that have been? Back in the 60s? How is it today? Is it any different? It is not. It is not. The human body can cope with about two courses in a lifetime. Did you hear that? About two courses in a lifetime. It should be kept as a life-saving resort. In our natural remedies classes in the morning, we're showing different remedies. If you've been unable to attend them, um, they are being taped, so you'll, you'll be able to see that. Simple things that you can do for simple ailments so you don't have to go to the antibiotics. Sometimes I would take my child to the hospital, especially if I was concerned, and they would assess. They just about always give a course of antibiotics. Now, don't argue with the doctor. You know what you say? Thank you. Thank you so much for your advice. Thank you. Put it in your bag and go home and put a potato poultice on or an onion on the feet or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. D don't argue with them because they don't understand they have never been trained in garlic poultices. Is that right? In ginger poultices, in onion poultices. And maybe their great-grandmother did it. Because hmm? this is things people used to do. One percent of doctors are, da are now claiming that antibiotics have caused more problems than they ever cured. What are they referring to? They're referring to the mold aspect of disease, specifically cancer, because cancer is a fungus. Can you really say that blanket statement? Now remember, they're just opportunist organisms. They're just going to live where there's something to eat. And they not only live on waste, they not only live on damage, they also live on heavy metals, they also live on chemicals, they also live on poisons that come into the body. That's why one of the best things you can do is keep those eight laws of health. Keep drinking that water, go to bed early, exercise every day, eat nourishing food. Then you're giving the body all the things it needs because we are a self-healing, self-cleansing organism. Dr. Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. Got that? <laughs> so on Wednesday night when we go on our journey through the gut, I will show you how you can speed that process up a little bit. So how does mold get into the body, yeast and fungus? It can be breathed in, it can come in through your skin, it can be ingested, and it can also be sexually transmitted. But the million dollar question is, how do we get it out? And how do you know you got yeast in the body? Your tongue should be pink from the tip to the back. Usually in the break, everyone's rushing to the bathroom to look at their tongue. If you can scrape off the white coating, it's waste. If you can't scrape off the white coating at the back of your tongue, they're little fungus buds. Do you remember when doctors used to look at tongues? But the million dollar question is how can we eliminate this yeast from the body? Number one, starve it. So let's, let's use um, six Steve as an illustration. What's yeast and fungus's favourite food? Sugar and other yeasts. So all sugars need to be eliminated, all yeasts. The only yeast that's possible is the sourdough bread because even though the sourdough bread, it's a cultured bread, it has a little bit of yeast in it. It also has lactobacillus acidophilus, which balances out the yeast. Also, the house must be checked. No mould in the house. No mould at all. We had a girl do our program. She was only 35. She had advanced breast cancer and she had some small children. And when she heard this lecture, she had said, oh, no. We said, what is it? She said, my house. This was her house. Now, in Australia, our northern side is our sunny side and our southern side is our shady side. That's the opposite to you, yeah? So all her bedrooms were here. That's her bedroom and ensuite, and these are the children's bedrooms. 
This is the northern side, so this is the no sun side, and she had great big trees all along the back. What are those rooms like? They're damp. And because she had an ensuite there, her bedroom was particularly damp. She said, I'm always wiping the black mold off the ceiling. Whoa. She said, oh no. She made arrangements she could not go back to that house. It was a very, very sad case because she only lived another three months. She came to us very advanced stages. There's a series SBS television put on in Australia a few years ago. It's called Is Your House Killing You? Ooh, it is an eye-opener. So you've got to search out that house. Maybe trees need to be cut down. Maybe the gutterings need to be cleaned out. Keep those windows open and have that fresh air coming in. If someone has a white tongue and they don't have cancer, you can certainly have yeast and not have cancer. They would just go to a low sugar diet like just grapefruit, Granny Smith apples. But if someone comes to us wanting help with cancer, we say no fruit for six weeks. Because cancer cells consume 15 times the glucose of any other cell. I'm going to touch on this tonight, but my book, Self Heal by Design, explores all of this in detail. In fact, my book really is a total exploration of what I'm showing you tonight. Number two, we're looking at how to eliminate yeast from the body. Kill. I think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but one of the most potent antifungal herbs on the planet, in fact, it's very potent antibiotic, is garlic. Garlic. How simple is that? Garlic. If you want to use it as an antibiotic, you have to have three raw cloves a day. Now, the antibiotic sandwich I told you about, I think that's the nicest way to have it. Underneath is sandwiched with the toast and olive oil, and on top it's sandwiched with the avocado and tomato. Also, grapefruit seed extract, olive leaf extract, oregano oil, but that has to be taken cautiously, just starting with a couple of drops, not in your throat or you'll burn it out. It's very strong. In a little bit of coconut oil or a little bit of water. Portiaco is a South American herb that's antifungal. Number three is balance. Flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys. There's your probiotic. You can get lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacteria, powders, supplements. They're best taken three quarters of an hour before breakfast so that they go way down to your, to your gut. And alkalize. I think it's Friday night I'm going to be giving a lecture on the acid-alkaline balance in the body. In my book, there's a chapter on the acid-alkaline balance in the body. Is it that simple? It is. Aren't you glad it's that simple? I believe God meant it to be simple. We're about to have a break. So let me tell you the story of Elizabeth Cott before we have a break. Elizabeth Cott came to us five years ago with three big tumors in her abdomen. The doctor said to her, you've got to start chemotherapy immediately. This is aggressive. She didn't like the sound of it. She didn't like the sound of the side effects. So she came to our retreat for two weeks. And for two weeks, we worked with her doing this. She told me that she was the, she was the dessert maker at church and she made a meringue dessert this big with 16 cups of white sugar in it. She said, I've been a vegetarian, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, but she said, I believe that that sugar was what was feeding my cancer. So she stopped all that. She said, whatever you tell me to do, I will do. We blended wild greens and, and strained it, so she was drinking the green drinks. We'd had a few other treatments to help alkalize the body. She went back to the doctor three months later, had a test, test her cancer markers, her inflammatory markers, and the doctor said, keep doing what you're doing and, and come and see me in six months. Now, what did he say three months earlier? You've got to start chemo immediately. This is aggressive. 
She went back six months later and the doctor said, I can't understand it, I cannot explain this, but one of your tumours is gone. A year later, another tumour had gone. This lady said to me, I can't believe how good I feel. She said, I'm in my late 60s now. I feel better than I even felt in my 40s and 50s. She's lost weight. She's off all her medication for blood pressure, for cholesterol. She's off her sleep apnea machine. All of these things started to resolve. She gives, she gives little cooking classes now and tells her story. It's a powerful story. When she goes to see the doctor today, her oncologist is there, her specialist is there, her doctor's there, and they're all just looking at her. One of the claims against me in Australia that this is a fictitious character. <laughs> we will give you her phone number if you like. You can talk to her. <laughs> it is certainly not a fictitious character at all. And it is one of many stories that we've seen of the amazing body and its ability to heal itself when given the right conditions. I've been asked, Barbara, you have so many success stories. Do you have any failures? I said, the only failure would be the part of the, on the person to do what you've got to do to get the results. I'm going to give you a break now. So it is quarter past eight. Is that right? Yes, it is quarter past eight. If we can go back in ten minutes, I'm going to show you in that last 35 minutes how you can boost your immune system. Before you go on the side, there's a, um, a black vessel. And it's part of the GPS B55, the Alive Surround. Black vessel. It's part number GPS B55, the Alive Surround.
Shevin, one of you come up here, please. Any one of you.
welcome back everyone where we look at how we can how you can boost your immune system what is your immune system what are the defenses in your body that God has put in there to fight disease so we're going to look first of all at the number one defense system and that is your skin did you know your skin is like a suit of armor and your skin does three things your skin throws off waste and we know when you've you've worn a white shirt at the end of the day is a little bit of brown on your on your collar dr kellogg called the pores of the skin millions of little sewers ooh <laughs> throwing off waste so it throws off waste and that's why maybe sometimes you go to a gym and have a sauna, is that right? And I know at our retreats we always have st saunas, steam saunas. My daughter lives in Wisconsin and she has seven children. The eldest is 21 and the youngest is eight months old. Right in the middle there, there are twin girls that are 15 and a whole lot of others. And she bought herself, it cost her $16,000 and she worked hard. She's still paying it off, a steam sauna out and it's outside and in Wisconsin all around the steam sauna at the moment is what snow and it and they build a little fire there's a fire and they get in there and have their steam sauna she's got I think you call it a horse trough is that right this big tub it's about this big and you run you're in there I was in there a few weeks ago you have to fill the water up half an hour before you have your sauna or it'll freeze <laughs> and you run out and dip in there and go back in the sauna and do that three times and you are perspiring a lot a lot of waste is coming out of there so three things your skin does it throws off waste it breathes did you know that and there's a very sad story of the little girl who was painted gold for a play to be an angel and she died if you cover that whole skin it breathes the the body will die so be very careful what you put on your skin I'm very cautious as to what touches my skin I don't use any hand sanitizers you saw in the last lecture we've got to get away from this kill mentality yes I wash my, yes, I wash my <laughs> yes I have a shower every day absolutely but you have a look at what is in those hand sanitizers. There's chemicals. Now, I never say never. You might like to be cautious when you go into a public toilet or something. I went into a public toilet the other day and there was, um, there was nothing to dry my hands with. <laughs> and I have a little bottle of eucalyptus oil in my bag. And when I shake my hands a little bit, it wasn't a very clean toilet. I, um, I put a few drops of eucalyptus oil on my hand and I guess if you want a hand sanitizer, there it is. Just get some essential oils, yeah? We've got to get away from the kill mentality because this kill mentality is creating super bugs. Is that right? Because remember, when you throw poisons at them, what do they do? They adapt and adjust. They adapt and adjust. And that's what's happening with the overuse of antibiotics. Let's come back to the skin. Be careful what you put on the skin. Please don't put any chemicals on the skin. If you do, your skin will absorb them and that increases the chemical load in your body. And I have to tell you, we are exposed to enough that we don't even choose to go in, in the air that we're breathing. Be very careful as to what's in your laundry detergent. It's time to get the magnifying glass out because they're in tiny letters, isn't that true? And find out what's in there. Have a look at what's in your laundry detergent. Have a look at what is in your, your kitchen soap that you're using. What's in your, yes, hand sanitizers. And the bigger the word, the, the scarier it gets. Is that right? And also... Uh, your, your clothes, be very careful on wearing natural fibres because your skin absorbs. Skin throws off waste, your skin breathes and your skin absorbs things. There are little microbes on your skin. 
and those little microbes are part of your immune system. Let's go to the orifices now because we've just discovered that we have a suit of armour over our body and that is the skin. And by the way, if the skin gets broken, you have to be careful, don't you? You have to clean it, is that right? You have to clean it, cover it, keep it together so that any harmful pathogens in the air don't get in, is that right? What's an infection? Some people say, I got an infection. Do you remember what Antoine Beauchamp said? Dis disease is born innocent of us. Clean that wound. I remember my son Peter, when he was about 12, I was giving a meeting at a home school camp called the Mother the Nurse. And Peter went outside in the morning and he started the generator and it flipped him and he flipped over and scraped his shin on a star post, you know, and it was a bit of a rusty star post. And he came in and he goes, Mom, look what I did. And I said, Pete, let's do nothing. Let's do absolutely nothing to that wound and let it get all horrible, ready for the meeting, the mother, the nurse. I wanted to show that even at that stage, there's things you can do. The, the meeting was in two days. He woke up the next morning, oh, it looked really bad. It was all swollen. Had a scab on there and it had a, a little bubble there of clear stuff coming out. He goes, Mom, Mom, look at it now. <laughs> I said, looking great, Pete. That's exactly what we want. Now, the meeting was the next afternoon. And that day, Peter went and climbed a tree, as boys do, and he knocked the scab. And the scab came off and blood and pus went all over his leg. He came running down, sorry, Mum, I've knocked, I've knocked the scab off. Look. And I said, great. <laughs> That's exactly what we want it to look like. I wanted to show that there is no need for fear. And of course we don't let it get to that. But I wanted to show that even when it gets to that, there's things you can do. What did we do? We poured hydrogen peroxide on it. Oh, don't kids love that because it all fizzes up, cleans it out nicely. I think we put a grated potato poultice on it, which would get the swelling down, which would draw out any waste and just keep it clean. But can you see my point? I wanted to show them that even if you leave it and it starts to look really bad, there's still something you can do. You can put an onion poultice on it. You put a ginger poultice on whatever. Anything that's moist and will open it and bring out the waste. So your skin. Now let's go to the orifices. When you come to the orifices, let's look at the orifices on the head. Let's look at the ear. We've got an eardrum there that protects. And we've also got little hairs there that trap. And we've got earwax that can trap. So there's a whole lot of things happening in the ear to protect it from any harmful pathogens in the air. And your eye. Isn't your eye an amazing thing? If something comes along and hits, your bones stop it. And if it comes near, you automatically blink. Is that right? And look at the eyelashes. Oh, we looked in the next car today, and here's an, a lady with eyelashes, the biggest eyelashes I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> but I don't think they were natural. <laughs> they almost looked an inch long. But God put the eyelashes there for a purpose. Is that right? <laughs> and those eyelashes are there to stop any foreign object coming in. But if something does get in, maybe a bug gets in, then, it, then there's the mucus around the eye which will actually um, trap that little bug. And I think we all know if you get a bug in your eye, you just make your eye go round the world. Is that right? And it'll, it'll actually push it to the corner of the eye and you can, you can flip it out. So can you see all these processes to protect against any harmful pathogens? And the nose. The nose is particularly interesting. Inside the nose, there are little cavities, like little caves. And your nose does three things. It purifies the air, it warms the air, and it moistens the air. 
Mouth does not do that. So it's very, very important to breathe through your nose because your, nose, your mouth hasn't got any hairs, has it? In fact, we should be nose breathing and abdominal breathing. Some might say, but I can't breathe through my nose. Where's my why? Why not? Well, I can't breathe through my nose because it's all clogged up. Why? Well, there's a whole lot of mucus there. Why? Well, if you're having your nose clean, that's understandable. But some people, they're blowing their nose every day. Is that right? Even, and, they've, and they're all clogged up. Why would that be? Allergens. What are the most common allergens? We looked at this yesterday. The most common allergens that cause that buildup of mucus, and remember what the mucus is, it's just a reaction by the body to protect the lining of those fine little delicate parts of your body, which is your station tubes. And the most common allergens are if a person's breathing in chemicals. They can certainly irritate, and so the mucus is produced, remember to protect, or mold. We had a guest who had, she, she had asthma. And I said, when did you first get asthma? She said, when I was five years old. I said, did something change when you were five? She said, yeah, we moved into another house. And us kids loved the lounge room because in the corner, in the carpet, mushrooms grew. See, she's down here, and what's she breathing in? Here's the mold. Another lady told me she'd taken her little boy to the hospital. She said, every week we're rushing him to hospital, in the emergency, in the middle of the night with a severe asthma attack. So I began to investigate. They live on the shady side of the house. It's an old house. It's a slab on the ground. And when it rains a lot, the water comes in one corner. I said, where does the little boy sleep? Bunk beds. What's the top mattress like? Oh, it's not. It got mouldy a while ago. So the boy on the top bunk, he's fine because he's breathing in fresh air. But every time he moves, what's happening to the little boy underneath? I, they live out in the country. I said, look, when you get off the phone, can you go in the bedroom, get the mattress, take it out into the paddock and put a match to it, please? Yeah? Children, children are light. They, they can sleep on the floor. <laughs> you can just put a couple of blankets down on, on the frame. I said, and the little, the little boy that's getting the asthma put him to bed in the lounge room every night because it was the sunny room of the house. No more did she take that little boy to hospital every night or every week. The main food allergens are peanuts. Peanuts are commonly tainted with mould. They are a legume. They grow in the ground. They mould very easily. The book China Study by Dr. Colin Campbell, he shows very clearly the link between fungal problems and cancer with the peanut. Now, if you're feeling very sad right now because you love peanut butter, <laughs> try almond butter, try cashew butter. They're just as nice. So when people have an allergy to peanuts, it's actually not the peanut, it's the mold on the peanut. And the mold that grows commonly on the peanut is aspergillus and it gives off aflatoxin. That's, that's the mold waste. Also wheat, we've talked about this a couple of times and I'll be exploring it in more detail in some other lectures. The hybridized wheat of the day, the hybridization of the wheat created an incredibly complex starch and protein structure. And it is that hybridized wheat that so many people have allergies today. And also dairy. A common allergen to dairy or an allergy to dairy infested by ear infections, bronchitis, sinus problems, and also um, asthma. So they're the most common allergens that are, that are causing this excess mucus. So you've got to investigate if someone can't breathe through their nose. Let's go back to the nose. When you're breathing air that's not really clean air, it might have a little bit of dust on it, it's heavy, 
So it actually knocks all around, it ricochets all around those little caves inside your nose and the ricocheting around all those little caves in your nose causes the dust to drop and then the air becomes light and it can go down to the trachea. Isn't that fascinating? You didn't realise this is happening every time you breathe, did you? And then at the end of the day, you get a tissue and blow the nose. Is that right? Then all the little bits of, of dirt come out. What about mouth? Again, we should be nose breathers. One lady said, I was running up the hill and I had to breathe through my mouth. I said, that's right. Aren't you glad when you're exercising, you've got two places to get air in? And aren't you glad when you've got a cold and your nose is stuffy, you can breathe through your mouth? So it's not that you never breathe through your mouth, but your nose should be your main area where you take in the air because it purifies the air, it warms the air, moistens the air and cleans the air. Now let's come to mouth. So the mouth is where the food goes in. Yep. And sometimes there may be pathogens on the food. Is that right? In fact, I was at my sister's house one day and her daughter, she's about 22, she was patting the dog and then she went and made the salad with those hands. Mm -hmm. So um, animals in the home. Animals in the home can be a source of disease because they are not clean animals. And so when animals are in the home, you haven't got good air. And especially if animals are on carpet and if animals are sitting on cloth chairs or cloth lounges. At, at our retreat where I used to work, we used to do a live blood analysis. And I was looking at, at a live blood analysis one day. You just do a, a drop of blood on the slide and put it up on the microscope. We saw a um, parasite. And, and I was moving, chasing this parasite all around the blood. And I said to the lady, do you have animals in your home? She said, uh, I sleep with three cats every night. I said, well, look what they've given you. Yeah, get rid of the cats and get a hot water bottle. We, we are exposed to enough without adding to it. Is that right? When I was a little girl, cats and dogs were outside. Yeah. Outside. <laughs> and they're born with wonderful fur coats. <laughs> and you don't need them so much in Florida. Is that right? So let's come down into the stomach. In the stomach there is a wonderful part of your immune system. It's called hydrochloric acid. On Wednesday, when we go on our journey through the gastrointestinal tract, we will also be looking at hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is antifungal. Hydrochloric acid is antibacterial. Hydrochloric acid connects with an enzyme called pepsinogen and that releases pepsin, which breaks down protein. I have never met anyone with too much acid in their stomach. It is actually, a, a too acid stomach is a non-offent. You see, dogs have six times the hydrochloric acid that humans have and they don't have reflux mm? and they don't have stomach ulcers and they break that meat, they eat down very quickly. Some would say, well, I must have too much acid. It's coming up. There's nothing wrong with the acid. It's a little gate there that's not stopping it. Why would that gate be weak? It would be weak because the person eats their largest meal at the end of the day, then goes to bed, and gravity causes it to push up and weaken that little muscle. So I guess you've never thought of your hydrochloric acid as being a front line uh, killer for any pathogens that might come in on the food. Now, if the hydrochloric acid is low, and unfortunately with some people it is low because they're eating all day long, they're eating their main meal at the end of the day, they're drinking with their meals, which waters the hydrochloric acid, and they're overeating, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and they're stressed all the time, which actually blocks hydrochloric acid. We'll look at that in detail on Wednesday night when we look at the gut. 
So many people have lost their frontline defense in their hydrochloric acid. So let's say the pathogens survive and they come further down to the small intestine where you've got your villi and remember the next line of defense is your lactobacillus acidobolus bifidus bacterium, the friendly bacteria. But unfortunately, your statin drugs knock them off. Cortisone wipes them out. Antibiotics wipe them out. Contraceptive pill wipes them out. So can you see we've lost another defense down there? And so now there are some bacteria and pathogens that are getting into the blood and they shouldn't be there. So what's next? Well, God put in the blood white blood cells. So your white blood cells are designed to kill any harmful pathogens. So your white blood cells, you've got five different types of white blood cells. You've got neutrophils. Sorry, it's NU. Neutrophils. They're the most common of your white blood cells. They take up about 60% of your white blood cells. And you've also got monocytes. They take up about 15%. You've got lymphocytes. These are the white blood cells that are made in your lymph nodes. And the lymphocytes make up about, let's see, 15% again. So 60, 70, 80, 90, we're up to 90. And you've, all, you've got your eosinophils and your basophils. Yes, I am. So that's about 5%, 5%. They're your white blood cells. Now your lymphocytes are the scouts. They roam around looking for any harmful pathogens and they let the monocytes and the neutrophils know and they come along and kill. And they've got a little bit of hydrogen peroxide in them. Did you know that? And they kill. Sacrifice themselves for you. When they kill, they die. And that's pus. Did you know that? That's what it is. It's dead white blood cells doing their jobs. And when someone's got a chest uh, complaint and they're coughing up yellow, when you see that, rejoice. What is it? It's your dead white blood cells doing a really good job at cleaning up that area. Mm-hmm. But your eosinophils should only be about 5%. And the eosinophils and the basophils, they light up really bright. So when you're doing a live blood analysis, you can see them because they light up like little lights. And you should have about 2% eosinophils. That's about 2 in a drop of blood. And you can easily see the other ones. Sometimes I see people with 5 eosinophils. And that means they have a sensitivity to wheat and dairy. And then sometimes I see people that have got 10 eosinophils, remember, instead of two. That means they are intolerant to wheat and dairy. And then sometimes I see people with about 21 eosinophils. They are celiac. That means they cannot handle uh, the gluten at all. Now, I see this in the blood. And when I talk to the people, they already know it. <laughs> and I was, I was uh, consulting with a young couple one day. And she was 33, he was 35. And I saw 21 eosinophils in her blood. And I said, whoa, you are celiac. You can't even handle wheat. She said, I know. Whenever I eat wheat, I get diarrhea, I get rashes. I know. I, can't, I, I shouldn't eat it. And she'd recently eaten it, and that's why I saw that in the blood. Then I had a look at her husband's, and he was the same. I said, well, he said, this is ridiculous. He said, I don't get rashes, I don't get diarrhea. And she looked at him and she said, yeah, but you fall asleep in the restaurant. <laughs> One of the most common signs of an intolerance to wheat is brain fog. And how many people have brain fog and blame age? Sorry, you can't do that anymore. And bloating, how many people have bloating? 
And so many people have it, they just live with it thinking, this is life. One lady said to me, I stopped all the wheat. I started to have spelt bread. I started to have uh, millet for breakfast. I had rice. She said, after two months, I could not believe my energy levels. She said, I I did not (laughs) realise. I did not realise that my brain fog and my bloating were, were that. Anyone that has any skin problems, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. Anyone that has asthma, eczema, psoriasis, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. I could almost have an answering service on my phone, stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. In fact, it's a challenge. Try it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things. So the challenge by the Bible is prove this. Don't start tomorrow. You've got to get all the other stuff out of your cupboards, fill it with the good stuff, and Trader Joe's, your whole foods, you've got gluten-free cereals, you've got gluten-free pastas. There's so many options today, very nice brown rice pastas. There's so much that you can do, so much you can do. So have your cupboards and your freezers full of the good stuff. But just see what it does. Can you, see, can you see one of the things that's the biggest damper to our immune system? Here it is right here. It's the biggest damper to our immune system. I'm, it is not possible for me to do this, but it would be very interesting to seriously assess the people that have come down with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So, million dollar question, how can we boost it? In our local town, it's an hour and a half away, there's a little German baker that makes beautiful sourdough bread. He says, I always know when you've been giving means because because I sell out of the spelt sourdough bread. One lady said, how do you spell spelt? You got it. (laughs) The best booster for your immune system is pure air. And it's very easy to have your window open here in Florida. Isn't that true? Oh, there's beautiful breeze coming in. Number two, sunshine. I had, a little, I had a little bit of sewing to do on a skirt that the zipper needed a stitch today. I sat out in that sunshine. And it was just the most beautiful sunny day. And after about 10 minutes, I got a few drops of rain. Did you notice that? It's hard to run inside. This is Florida, yeah? It's like when we're in Melbourne, people said, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute. <laughs> Changes. Try and get that sunshine every day. It boosts that blood, which boosts your immune system. Number three, stop. There are some things that must stop. These must stop. Let's let's add to it. Tobacco. Caffeine. And remember, I was telling you the story of the lady that told her husband to stop coffee and he had a terrible headache. I said, he's got to go back on it, but half dose. Ease off it. Ease off. Alcohol. Go to the foods that God made. There are things that must stop. Number four, rest. Now, who can remember how many hours not negotiable we must have every night? Good students. Good students. Now, if your body's not used to it, it'll get used to it. And if you're, in the, if you're asleep and you wake up at 3 in the morning, do you know what you do? Thank God. Say, thank you, Father in heaven, I can't sleep. And I was telling a lady like this last week that couldn't sleep. She said, what? I said, well, what else can you do? Thank you, Father, that I can't sleep. I can now talk to you. 
In everything give thanks. Don't look at your phone because the light on the phone tells your brain it's daytime. Well, you can't now because it's out of your bedroom. Is that right? Is, is that right? It's in the hallway. Is that right? Yeah. Number five, exercise. Exercise moves blood and your blood is your carrier of your white blood cells. Every day we should be doing some form of exercise. Six, proper diet. Food that God made. Food as it comes from the hand of the creator. What did I have for breakfast this morning? I had a grapefruit and I had chia seed. You know chia? High in omega-3. Oh, it's so yummy all over your grapefruit and then you mop it up in your grapefruit. If you're not fussed on grapefruit, I love grapefruit. You might go for berries. You might... You got some good organic fruits in your whole foods. I had fruit. Then I had the slice of sourdough spelt toast. Very nice. Then I had olive oil on top of that. And then I had cayenne pepper on top of that. And I had avocado and some Celtic salt on that. And then I had a cob of corn. Breakfast. And I had no hunger for almost six hours. I love that. What did I have for lunch? I had a salad of lettuce and tomato and cucumber. No, avocado. And we bake some potatoes because my husband's an Irishman. Every meal has to have potatoes. <laughs> so we have potatoes and sweet potatoes. And then I made a big lentil stew. It was very, very nice. Very nice. That was lunch today. And I had, because my husband slept in, he's still catching up on jet lag. He's only been in the country for about four days, whereas I've been here for a month. So I'm well over it. So he didn't wake up till half past seven. That's very late for us. So we didn't have breakfast till about eight o'clock. So we didn't have lunch till about 2.30. It is now nine o'clock. I have no hunger. So the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer are fiber, protein, and fats, good fats. I put olive oil on everything. On my potatoes with Celtic salt, it is delicious. Olive oil and Celtic salt on my salad. Olive oil and Celtic cider, my stew, very nice. There's your proper diet. Number seven, use of water. The body must be well hydrated, but the most powerful way to boost the immune system is your hot and colds. And I've tasted your cold. I mean, I have felt your cold, and it's quite cold, isn't it? Even in Florida. So remember, you've had your hot shower, and you have to turn it past the cold to turn it off. We don't have that. We have a hot tap and a cold tap. But I, in America, you seem to have one knob, yeah? And then don't let it go quite off. And you know when you get to the right spot, when you go... <laughs> we, we don't want cool. We want cold. We want the good stuff. And that has a powerful effect on your immune system because it is in your bone marrow where your blood and your white blood cells are made. And if you can endure it for 10 seconds, you're doing very, very well. You go to the top of the class. Go to the top of the class in the best immune system in town. Mm -hmm. And eight is trust. Trust in divine power. Trust in this amazing body that God gave us that has been designed to heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And in the book, The Ministry of Healing, page 127, she says, these are the true remedies. These are the remedies. This is what will boost your immune system. And you know what I love about that? There's no expensive supplements. Mm. So the money you save on expensive supplements, you spend on buying the best quality olive oil. Extra cold pressed, extra virgin cold pressed. The best quality Celtic salt with its 82 minerals. The organic foods. That's the only thing you have to pay for, is that right? Everything else is free. 
God gave it. In Isaiah 42 verse 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that brought forth the earth and that which comes out of it, He that giveth breath to the people upon it and spirit to they that dwell therein, I the Lord, thee in righteousness I will hold thine hand. He will hold you all through this journey. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee. I will give thee for a covenant of the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes. Do you feel tonight your eyes have been opened? To open the blind eyes. To bring the prisoners out of the prison. Many are imprisoned to these addictive substances and sorry I forgot to put one of the highest addictive ones which is your refined sugar if you want to break yourself from those addictions fast for a day if you want a little bit of help with this you can book into Eden Valley Health Retreat next week <laughs> in Denver Colorado I will be for two weeks excellent health retreat that are running our Misty Mountain program now. Because remember what God says, I will hold thine hand. I will help thee. I will help thee through this journey to open the blind eyes, to bring the prisoners out of the prison, to, to, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Let us close our eyes. As we close, Father in heaven, thank you so much for opening our eyes. Thank you so much. Your aim is to bring the prisoners out of the prison house. Thank you, Father, for promising to hold our hand through this journey to guide us and to keep us. For you have said in Psalm 32 verse 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. You have promised that you will guide each one of us with thine eye. Thank you so much for these precious promises, Father, for we pray them tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. I thought before we, we end, I would go over the program, and my husband has put it up on the website. So tomorrow we ha do some more poultices and water therapy, and then tomorrow night we're going to be looking at the liver, and the second lecture is on the little chemical messengers called hormones. And then, so tomorrow's Tuesday. Wednesday morning, we're looking at child nutrition. And everyone who was ever a child should be here. <laughs> because it explains so much. And hormones are tomorrow night. So Wednesday morning, it's um, child nutrition. Wednesday night, it's heart health and diabetes. 